Hey everybody, this is Chris. It's time for chapter two of the Sitting Bench Chopumentary, with the focus being on wood collection, storage, and drying. Matt Cremona and I will be collaborating on this and we'll be looking at both primitive and modern techniques. Now, if you don't know who Matt Cremona is, he's an amazingly talented YouTuber who designed and built his own bandsaw mill. He's an amazing woodworker, teacher, and artist. So please make sure you subscribe to him. The links will be in the cards and in the description section. Here we go. Well, it's time for chapter two of my chopumentary on the sitting bench. I'm here with Matt Cremona. Very oh. famous, infamous, the uh, DIY bandsaw mill. <laughs> Can't wait to... is probably the best word for it. That's right. That's right. Your invitation precedes you. <laughs> and what we want to do for the chopumentary is I'm going to show you um, for chapter two is how I collected the wood and how I treated it. And then as okay. we go through it, we're going to see how I did it. And then I'd like you to talk about how you would do it. And maybe we can add some video in. Crazy okay. in my own right. That's right. That's right. So let's get started. Here's the walnut tree I used for the sitting bench. This tree was struck by lightning about 10 years ago. It split into three sections. Here's the main one, which I cut the sitting bench from. There's one piece that goes back that way. And the third piece is right here. Now this tree is a gift that just keeps on giving. This is my fourth project I've done on this. Including the sitting bench, I've done the Right This Minute TV show carving. I think it turned out great. What do you think? Yeah! Oh, 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 Welcome to Right This Minute. We have enjoyed your videos Thank for you. even longer than I've been here. The Walking Dead animated carving. And finally, with a root I took from down there, I did the Japanese saw handle. Well, here it is. You can also note that this hangs over their quad trail, and so I cut off the end there because they're afraid it's going to fall on them eventually. I'll probably just keep on doing projects from this tree until I run out. So while we're on that, how do you normally get your wood? How, where do you find it? Do you have to pay for it? Sure. Um, most of my stuff... If you see me cutting it here on my property, it's been like, it's urban logs it's from someone's yard uh, throughout the city somewhere. And then the other stuff comes out from my friend uh, Jim's farm. He's got some wooded land on that property. Mm -hmm. So we kind of do the same thing as you did with that tree where we just go out there and we find things that's already been, you know, damaged or it's dead already or just, you know, whatever. It's still good stuff, but it's not going to be living out there. It's just going to rot, essentially, right. if you leave it out there. So a lot of my stuff comes from out there as well. It's just a fun experience just to get out there and just cut stuff and kind of try and save some, some logs here and there. <laughs> There's huge piles of poop on this thing, okay? Huge piles. So what are the chainsaws that, that you normally use, and why do you pick the, cert, the chainsaws that you use? So I use this one as my primary saw, the one I like walk around with for felling. It is a uh, steel MS460, it's 77 cc's, and I think it has, it's a good balance between having a, a, like a good amount of power, and it's also not super ridiculously big either, so it's not too hard to carry this thing around all day, but it is not a super light saw. <laughs> So for smaller work, I got this little tiny saw here. I think it's like 45 cc's. It's super light, so you can do all kinds of weird, crazy things with it, and it won't wear you out. My butt is soaking wet. <laughs> yeah, you can see the steam rising. My butt is soaking wet. No pain, no gain. I do this for you. I do this for you. <laughs> Woo! 
How was that for a camera shot? Okay, two down, one to go. It's a great workout. Hundred and seventy five beats a minute. Woo. Timber. Oh, man, I'm really tired. Come on. Finally! <sighs> Certainly not too bad splitting wood, but you basically just get the whole log and you throw it on the, yeah. on the mill, right? This stuff scares me. I'm scared, I'm not gonna lie, I'm very scared. Chainsaws, power tools scare me. So, I'm so nice, I'm gonna make him cut up this log with this sawmill. I'd rather do it by hand, but if, if since I'm here, I'll do it. Walnut is worth it, I promise you. Soon to be a sitting bench for my wife, per her request. Now I'm ready to move to the next phase. I'm gonna use my adz and single bevel broad axe to flatten out this half. This other half I'm gonna use for the parts. Here we go. This log is way too heavy for me to get out of here by myself. Are you done? Come here, come here. This log is way too heavy for me to get out of here by myself. So I've set up this woodland workshop and I'm gonna cut the notches out here. That'll reduce weight and allow me to get it up the hill.
Just one comment. There's a knot right here, and I have no idea how it's going to split. It might split off this way and crack this in half. So I'm going to saw through the knot before I chop it out. I deserve that. I deserve that. Uh, <laughs> that's just part of the fun. Yeah. I didn't break any bones, but this, it, it, it went too well up to this point. It did. It's so like, you, I, were, you were in for it. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I gotta admit, it felt good. <laughs> A little scary, but it felt good. <laughs> good. It's starting to take shape. I've removed most of the wood, but I've left these two notches here and the legs will come out of this. Let's start working on those. Well, I've got my bench, my legs, and my cross support. Now I need to take this back to my shop and figure out how to dry it out so it doesn't crack. And then I'll do the fine work. I've got the wood on You see how I didn't blink there? <laughs> that's, probably, that's probably like the tenth time that I did it. You know, I, like all the talking stuff I hate. I hate doing the talking stuff. People give me feedback, but after like ten times you don't blink. You're just like this. I've got the wood all back in my shop now. Here's the sitting bench top, the cross support, and then the legs are made from the crotch of the tree. I spent the last couple hours cleaning it all up. I used my scrub plane. I'm filming down here! I spent the last couple hours generating this pile of wood chips to clean all these pieces up. I used my scrub plane, my adzed, and my single bubble hatchet. Now I need to get set up to dry this out. I've already anchor sealed the end grains. Now I'm going to put a light coat of oil over the top of the wood. And then I'm going to wrap all the wood in paper and put it inside plastic garbage bags with holes in it. These three things will slow the moisture from coming out and it should minimize cracking and twisting. I've got this big roll of craft paper and I'm going to use it to make big paper bags to put the wood in. It's very important that you change the paper out every couple days when you first start drying the wood. Otherwise it'll soak up too much moisture and get kind of nasty. And that's also why you have holes in the garbage bags to let the moisture come out. Do you do anything different when you're harvesting the crotches of trees? Do you have to do anything with, different with them? 
No, I mean, if you don't want them to crack, like you seal them with some kind of anchor seal or some kind of sealant to help dry it, slow the drying process a little bit, or just dry them somewhere where it's not going to be super aggressively dry, mm -hmm. so they run dry as quickly. And that usually helps to keep them from doing any kind of cracking or distorting and weird stuff. But I mean, crotches is they're beautiful, but they're it's all interlocked grain and all woven together, so they can do a lot of weird stuff as they dry. All right, I'm all done. Now I'm gonna put it aside and let it dry. I didn't want any cracking to happen on the top side of this, so I, because the bottom was sapwood and I wanted the, the moisture to go out through the bottom, so I just treated the crap out of this so it wouldn't have any cracking. But I, like the paper and stuff was probably overboard. But you don't, you don't really do anything of that stuff, right? So these are my European style stacks. So this is the stuff, this is the way I dry the bigger stuff, at least initially. This stuff is uh, pretty big, so I try not to move them around too often, since stacking them is an effort in itself. So out here, there's a lot of air, air moving through here. It's, you know, it's kind of breezy on most of the days. So and you intentionally put it in the shade so it doesn't dry too fast? Yep, yeah, and it's in the, a nice shaded spot. So if you look up, there's a lot of uh, tree coverage here. So that keeps the sun away, which helps to, well, the sun will accelerate the drying process and make it uneven because it'll dry the outside faster than the inside, and um, it's not that great. You end up with a lot more cracking, a lot more drying defects that way. So the nice thing about this process is it's very gentle, but at the same time it's actually pretty quick because there is a lot of air movement just naturally outdoors like this because it's not in a confined space. So if you were to put a stack like this inside like a shed or a garage or something like that where the air is stagnant, you're not gonna have nearly the drying speed as you do out here. But at the same time, the Air, at least here in Minnesota, isn't super dry either most of the year, so it doesn't dry too quickly. Okay, and how do you, um, in any any particular way you stick it, any particular formula you follow or anything like that? Yeah, so the formula that I use is I have half inch stickers towards the bottom here, so that way the stickers don't contribute that much to the overall size of the stack, because once these things get up to like this point and you're lifting 300 pound slabs above your head, it's not as much fun. So the shorter I can keep the stack, the better. Um, and out here, the, the sticker sides doesn't seem to matter nearly as much because there is so much airflow. They don't have to really worry about uh, mold or things getting in between the stacks like that. Got so it. So I use the thinner, thinner stickers out here so I don't have as much dead space, essentially, in the stack. And how do you, what, what are the bases? How do those get set up? So the bases are set up on concrete block, kind of like a little foundation kind of thing. I see the spiders have been out here quite a bit. Uh, so I have some concrete block that's sitting right on the, on the dirt here. The soil here is very sandy and it's really well compacted already. So I place a layer of uh, solid block on the bottom and then I use some uh, regular concrete block on top of that to get some height off the ground. So as it rains you don't have a bunch of like dirt splashing back up onto the slabs. And then I have my little levelers here which I made that allow me to get all of the, all of the columns or the, all the bases in the same plane so that these things are sitting on a flat surface. So that way, with all this weight on top of it, the bottom slab has, I'd say, like 4,000 pounds or something like that on top of it, holding it down flat to that base. So that way, as it's drying, it's drying perfectly flat, and it's not going to be, it should have less chance of doing anything weird like twisting or cupping or pulling. Okay, Matt, we're down in your basement here. Is there anything uh, unique or special that you do? when they bring the wood inside? Like how long has this been in here and why is it in here? Yeah, so right now I'm like, I'm in the middle of a cycle. So I have a bunch of stuff outside that I still have to bring in here and stack whenever I have time to do that, among other things. Um, but it's like a little area in the basement where I do my drying, so I have it all stacked in here. And the basement for me is a really great place to dry lumber. It's really dry down here and I can control the drying process really easily since it's all indoors and contained. And I can get the lumber down to a workable moisture content. Do you um do you put a fan on it all down here or you just leave it? Initially, so the fan is something that I use to control the drying speed. So for the initial drying, if I bring it in freshly sawn, it's got a lot of moisture in it. What you want to do for that is use the fan to get all the surface moisture off as it's coming off, hmm. coming to the surface of the board, so you don't end up with mold. It's very easy for stuff to mold if you have too much surface moisture. That's a good place for mold to live. So initially, you're trying to you're dumping all of the free mo the free water from it, all the water that's just sitting there in the fibers of the wood. That's the fast stuff that comes off. There's a lot of it, and it produces a lot of humidity. Um, 
After that, you have all of the bound moisture, so that's all the water molecules that are bound through hydrogen bonds to the structure of the wood that takes a lot longer to come off. And for that, that's where you kind of need a little bit gentler process, so I won't run the fan for that. But the surface does stay dry enough, so you don't have to worry about mold at that point. That's much. I wish you'd have told me that before I stacked the uh, uh, flaming uh, box elder. Because <laughs> I got all kinds of mold on it right now. So... It's a surface mold. It'll come yeah, right off. Yeah, it'll come right off. Okay, great. As Matt just talked about, when you first stick fresh cut wood, you want to make sure there's enough airflow to avoid surface level mold, which is exactly what happened to my flaming box elder. Like these crotches I kept in bags for over a month, but I would change the paper out. And for the for the larger pieces, for the large bench piece, I I kind of kept it in plastic bags for like a week. That was, and then I would just keep paper on it and towels, and just so it slows it down. And that's how I did it for the rest of the time. And then maybe after six months, because this project took a year, then yeah. I then I uh, took the paper off and just left it out. And then it, and after about a year, it got to about ten percent. Nice. Well, that concludes chapter two. I hope you enjoyed it. Stay tuned for chapter three, where we focus on design and construction. And I appreciate if you could click on the link to subscribe to me on YouTube, and you can follow me on Instagram at Chris. And make sure you subscribe to Matt Cremona. Thank you.